Good morning, everyone. Let's turn to our first song this morning, number 469, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, 469. Let's sing. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Until then, daily we are bombarded with events that would make us think that God has abandoned us or that he doesn't even exist. And this is when we remember that we need to live by faith and not by sight. Let's sing number 632. 632. Remember 
reverently now come to God in prayer. If you're able to kneel, please do so. Dear Father in heaven, our everlasting arms, we lean on you this morning. We confess we don't know you like we should, and we haven't followed all your ways. But we thank you that you are a loving, patient, and merciful God. Thank you for the many blessings that you give us every day. Today we will return a small portion in the form of tithes and offerings to show our trust in you. Please continue to provide for us. Thank you for your promises to be with us and your soon coming to take us home to be with you forever. I don't know the needs of everyone here, but I know that you do, so I ask that you take care of them for us. And finally, please help us to understand today's message. Help us to draw closer to you through it. Thank you for hearing my prayer. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to um, sing our next song now as the deacons collect the offering. So deacons, please rise and collect the offering. And we're going to sing the well-known song, Alleluia. So just listen to my cues and we'll sing. So first, Alleluia.
the witness. May, may, maybe you have seen it before. You say, I, I, I saw that. You know, it's, it's okay. Uh, I've seen it for, you know, maybe three, four times. Well, uh, every year it's a little bit different, you know. This year it's different. And the mistakes that we made last night, probably we're not going to make them tonight, but we make different mistakes. You know, so in that sense it's different. But it's not about our mistakes that we make. It's about the story of the life of Jesus. And if you don't need this flyer, maybe I would say, give it to your neighbor. Give it to someone that you think he's not going to come anyway. Just give it to him. I want to share something. I did that with someone that I thought he's never going to come. No interest. I know this guy. He's not going to come. But, you know, I said, I'm just going to give him this, you know. Hey, look what we do for Easter. Come. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, the first night we had, Thursday night, he came. He's not from here. He's from Australia. He was just traveling here. And I knew that next morning he's going to fly and he has an early flight. And that's why I thought he's not going to come. But I'm just going to share with him. So, he came. And at the end, the first night of performance, it's the worst night it's still a rehearsal for many of us, especially the new ones, that they are there for the first time. And he came at the end. I went, I said, oh, Grant, you're here. Yeah, it was a beautiful performance. I love it. I'm so, I wish my wife was here to see it, my kids. But, you know, I enjoyed it so much. And it was midnight, 11.30 or midnight. I got a text from him. He said, Peter, you know, I think I have to start going to church again as I'm a Catholic, but I need to go back to church. A person that I thought, I never, I'm not going to see him there. So, you know, just leave your expectations, put them aside. Don't matter what you think of one or the other person. Just invite someone. The worst person you think of is not going to come, and even if he comes, not going to have any any effect on him. Just come. Do your part. And God does the rest. You know, it's not what we can do, but what God can do. So, if you have this flyer, take it with you. Or maybe if you, if you don't have a chance, just take a picture of this. Send a text to someone that you think of. And I would recommend you do what I did. And please come. You come too. Maybe grab somebody with you. Come. Amen. Let's turn now to our opening hymn, number 694. 694, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And please stand with me as we sing 694. <laughs> Sabbath, if all the little children could please come down the front, I'll be giving you a story today. You guys going to sit there?
Happy Sabbath, you guys. Oh, come on. Are you guys not awake? Happy Sabbath. That's bad. Okay, I'm going to tell you guys a story. How many of you guys like trains? 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 A couple of you guys? Okay, so when I was growing up, we had a Thomas the Tank Engine train set. And oh my goodness, there we had so many. Uh, they're like wooden blocks, and you can put them together, and you can build your own train tracks. And then we had so many different types of Thomas the Tank Engine trains from the, the uh, stories in the movies. And so what we would do is we would, my dad would build these train tracks and they would go up and over the furniture and they would go all these amazing places. And so my brother and I, we'd have so much fun doing this. But there came a point where sometimes I didn't like to share my my trains with him. Do you guys not like sharing sometimes? Is it hard to share sometimes? Do you like sharing your toys, Tate? Yeah, you do. Do you like sharing your toys, Tessa? I had a hard time sharing my toys. And so I remember sitting down and my brother came to play with me and I didn't want to let him play. These were my trains, these were my toys, and he can't play with me. And I remember that we had this little argument and we ended up going our own way. And he was playing with his trains over there and I was playing with my trains over there and I was getting lonely. It wasn't very fun playing by myself. And so I remember going over and asking my brother, I was like, do you wanna play with me? He was like, now you wanna play with me? I was like, yeah, but you still can't use my toys. You have to use your own toys still. <laughs> and it, it was just this weird thing. And I remember we, as we were playing, uh, there just came this sense of, why am I not sharing? Why are these toys so more important to me than my brother? And so as I started, I was like, this just isn't fun anymore. And so I was like, hey, would you like to share my toys with me? And he's like, yeah, of course. And the thing was, is he had one of the coolest trains ever. And he loved playing with it. And instead, he gave me a chance to play with the toy. So I want to encourage you guys that sometimes just sharing with your brother and your sister can be so much better than anything else. And it helps you feel a lot better when we share together. So I just want to encourage you guys to share. So would one of you guys like to pray? No? Okay, I'll pray. And then we have to collect the children's offering. Dear Father, Lord, thank you so much for giving us all another day of life. And thank you so much for each little young person here. Lord, I just ask that you continue to help us grow and help us share share everything, share our toys, and share what you have done for us. And we thank you so much for sharing your love and sharing your son with us. Continue to be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Good morning and happy Sabbath. 
Today we'll be reading the scripture reading for Ecclesiastes 5, 18 through 20. I have seen what is best for a person to do here on earth. He should eat and drink and enjoy his work. This is because the life God has given him on earth is short. God gives some people the ability to enjoy the wealth and property he gives them. He also gives them the ability to accept their state in life and enjoy their work. Such people do not worry much about how short life is. This is because God keeps them busy with the things they love to do. Happy Sabbath again. Mickey and I are going to sing for you, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Should the shadows come? 
Amen. Thank you, ladies, for sharing that beautiful song. We serve an amazing God, don't we? This morning, you know, as we come from week to week, it's a good reminder that um, the presence of God is here before we arrive. And I happen to think that his presence lingers afterward. And so let's just pause for a moment to recognize that the presence of God is here. And then also to take a moment to personally, we all have the busyness, the troubles, the cares of life. And we can't help it. We bring it through the doors with us. And sometimes we, we miss what God has for us because we're weighed down with these things. So is it okay if we just pause right now to let those things subside and let Jesus speak through his word to us today? Let's bow our heads. Father God, we are grateful that we are here this morning in your presence. We know that you are faithful. We know that you have something for each one of us, and it might be something different than the person sitting next to us, but you have something for each one of us to hear. And so we pray, God, that we will open ourselves up to you just now as we take a quiet moment, as we open ourselves personally to your spirit speaking to us today. Thank you, Jesus. We expect great things because you are here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if this is your uh, first time in the last few weeks being with us, if you're a guest here today or if you're a 50-year, you know, uh, member, VIP, whatever you might find yourself, this is an interactive service. So I don't know if you've been to an interactive service before, but this is called the Bible Lab. And right now we're studying the kingdom table, tales, the parables that Jesus uh, shared with us while he was here that short time that he was here on earth. So if you do not have a study guide, please raise your hand. We'll make sure that you get one. And then you should also have interaction cards. Interaction cards. Does everybody have this? Anybody need something? Oh, we have right over here. Let's see. Oh, you need one too? Oh, we got Auntie Joanne's going to bring them to you. Thank you, Auntie. And so we'll make sure you have one to follow along with. Again, this is an interactive service, so the more that you participate, the more you will enjoy this service. And um, we're going to be studying today the parable that's titled The Rich. What is it? The Rich. rich fool. <laughs> Everybody's got a different version here. What does it say there? The rich fool. All right, we're going to look at and see why is it titled the rich fool and is that accurate or not? But let's start out by asking some questions and you have your comment cards. You want your yes, no, or maybe cards out right now to be able to use. So you should find those yes, no, or maybe cards. And then as time goes along, you may find that you have a comment or a question or you resonate, somebody says something and you say, wow, I really love that. And you may hold up your love it card, okay? Um, so yes, no, maybe. You ready? Here we go. Got some questions for you. I am more financially stable than the person sitting next to me. I am more financially stable than the person sitting next to me. <laughs> wow, we have quite the mixture. Uh-huh, some of you are saying, oh, maybe, uh-huh. Oh, somebody says, no, <laughs> we actually have a number of no cards. So if you're sitting next to each other and you both have the same answer, then that's trouble, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to, to, to admit. Um, all right, number two, retirement is or will be the most relaxing period of my life. Retirement is or will be the most relaxing period of my life. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of yes cards out there. Oh, that's some maybes, all right? And we have a few no's as well. Um, <laughs> this, this gets fun. All right. I become extremely uncomfortable when I receive a large, unexpected amount of money. I become extremely uncomfortable. 
Uh, there's a lot of people saying, no, I'm not uncomfortable at all. <laughs> Some people are saying, yes. Uh, you know, I, I love the, the, those that raise the yes card. If you need any help deciding what to do with that, we've got lots of projects that, uh, that I could certainly bend your ear on. I <laughs> would love that. And some maybes. All right. All right. Good. All right. What about God only gives us, now this is interesting, this goes back to our own environment, our own experiences in life. God only gives us the amount of money that we can handle and not lose sight of Him. So God's only going to give you what you can handle, but yet not cross over that line where we lose sight of Him. Okay, so, uh, uh, quite a few yeses, those that are raising cards, probably 60-70 percent. Uh, wow, seeing maybe 30 percent, um, 30 percent maybes and, and a few no's. All right, good. All right, you see how this is getting us thinking, right? Getting us processing, that's good. All right, money is the root of all evil. Money is the root of all evil. I see some maybe cards. It's awesome. I see some yeses, uh, but most people are saying no. All right. Money is not the root of all evil. All right. Interesting. All right. Good. Good. Well, we're going we're gonna to study a little more into this this morning. What is it that God is trying to speak to us? But before we even go there, I want to ask you a, maybe a more personal question or something that's more applicable to you as a person. So this will be a time where you raise your comment card so we can hear your thoughts. For those who are working towards retirement, what are you most looking forward to? For those of you that are looking forward to retirement, we do have a microphone for you um, if you have a comment to make. Those that are looking forward to retirement, what is it that you're most looking forward to? Or maybe if you're already retired, what's, uh, for the retirees out there, what do you enjoy the most about retirement? So either what are you looking forward to or what are you enjoying the most? You're just going to shout it out. Freedom. Freedom! All right, good. Good, good, good. No homework. All right, said by our faithful teacher. <laughs> no more grading homework? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> homework or grading homework. All right, good. Anybody else? What are you looking forward to most or have you enjoyed the most? We have one right back here. Oh, Cowie's got gotcha. you. Perfect. A green mic. Not having pressure to meet job performance goals mm. and deadlines. Ah, not having to meet those goals and dreaded deadlines. I might hear an amen over here if they're <laughs> thinking of somebody in particular that has lots of deadlines throughout the year over and over and over again. You know, you, you work up to those deadlines and whew, you relax for about three hours and then you realize you have another deadline coming up. <laughs> yeah, see some heads nodding over here. Yes. Wow. Okay. What is it that you enjoy the most out of retirement or that you're looking forward to the most? Anybody else? Tate's looking forward to retirement. Good. Over here. Oh, Auntie Wilma oh, has one. I'm oh, a, sorry. I'm a little bit young, but I'm waiting. Yes. I'm waiting to get to my to-do list. Your to-do list. Okay. All right. You have a to-do list. So you're looking forward to that in retirement. I will, uh, well, I'm already retired, but I was looking forward to spending time with my 18 grandchildren and spending a hobby because I have a farm. I wanted to see if I could get my farm under control and sleep in late. Sleep in more, late. But that hasn't come true. <laughs> so, Auntie Wilma, you're retired now, right? Okay. So, just wanted to remind you that you are retired now because you, you sound like you're still looking forward. So it's okay to sleep in late tomorrow, all right? I think. Wow, that's good. Well, we love your, your love for life and your grandkids. Yes, that's the, the best part about retirement, right? Spoil the grandkids. All right. Anyone else? Oh, yes, right in the back. Uh, 
I, my current work is uh, pretty stressful and a lot of my, uh, I, I'm, a lot of attention has to be given to my work. So I'm looking forward to the great unknown. Oh, looking totally forward different, to Totally different, totally different unknown territory for me. Yeah, yeah. Away from the demands of work. Is that coming soon? I, I think I've heard. Yes, this is exciting. All right. Good. So the interesting thing is when we think about retirement, uh, you know, some of your comments bring to mind, you know, you can't make opportunities. Have you thought about that? You can't make opportunities. You can only take opportunities or pursue opportunities. Sometimes we look forward so much to what the future is going to bring that we miss what today has in store. The interesting thing is, too, that it's really important that we look at the perspective. What is our perspective, and is our perspective accurate? Because if our perspective is not accurate, we might actually miss opportunities that God has in store for us. Speaking of which, we come to this parable. It doesn't seem like this parable's titled completely accurately. Jesus didn't title the story, though. We did. We call it the rich fool, but is Jesus making a bigger or maybe more important point? And by the way, why is Jesus calling this man a fool? Aren't we supposed to avoid that? The Bible says, don't say, you fool, raka, right? Interesting. Did Jesus really call this man a fool? So let's look into this. Luke chapter 12, if you don't have your Bibles, there should be one in front of you or, as you know, on your phone. Um, oftentimes, we'll turn around and go back home if we've forgotten our phone, but how often do we turn around and say, oh, I forgot my Bible? <laughs> but the cool thing is now you can have the phone on your Bible. You can even take notes. There's many apps that you can take notes. Um, and today... You can also take notes on the sheets that we gave you. That's what I uh, really love doing. I'm still the old pen and paper kind of note taker. Um, Luke chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, it says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Now, it's easy to read right past this in our current tradition, our current culture of today and miss some of the deeper meaning that Jesus was uh, conveying here. So let's take a closer look. The man calls Jesus what? Teacher. This is Luke's favorite word for rabbi. You'll see rabbi in some of the other books. But teacher, the same root word there, uh, it's didaskale. Didaskale, teacher. It was a common practice to seek out the teacher or the rabbi with your issues of law. So you would look for a rabbi to come and give your grievances to, and oftentimes they were very aware of the current local laws, and so they would give some input. They would give feedback, and so you would avoid having to go to the higher courts. They would help you settle your matters, your issues. So the man, man in the crowd assumed, hey guys, we're getting some feedback. We're getting some feedback in the mic, so I'm not sure. Thank you. Um, so the man in the crowd assumed that he was addressing a legal expert when he came to Jesus, someone familiar with those laws. And so what is his request, or dare I say his demand? What did you see there? Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. It's not like he's seeking advice, is he? He's just saying, hey, hey, you, <laughs> can you fix this problem over here? Right? Or fix this problem over here. But it literally, he's saying, order my brother to make portions of the abundance. Order my brother to make portions of the abundance. He's saying, hey, look, I want you to split things up between us. We've just come into this big windfall, and I want my share. I want out. This was actually quite offensive in the culture of the day. It was very offensive. Why is that? Well, because 
back then when a father would pass away and leave his business behind to the family, it wasn't something that they would just portion up. You know, today sometimes that's how it works, right? Say, oh, you know, people just say, oh, I want my money out of it, you know? And so then they split it up between the family. Well, this was not a common practice. It was actually a time where the family would come together and sit down and say, how are we going to make this business successful or even more successful? How are we going to carry on this family business, if you will? So he was being very disrespectful in what he was trying to do. But Jesus, notice Jesus' response to him. What does he say? What is it? Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Interestingly enough, the English doesn't quite capture that. There are different words for man, but this is anthrope. He's, it's basically like saying, dude, this isn't my problem, right? Dude. Who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? But the guy comes and he says, hey, help us out. And you you can almost visualize it, right? Hey, Jesus, you know, help us out. He's like, dude, that's not my problem. I'm not the judge. Who who said I was the judge? (laughs) Pretty cool. But let's keep reading. Luke chapter 12, 15 to 20. Then he said, just listen into the story, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. So now Jesus goes into a parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. What do we call that? A bumper crop. Yeah, a bumper crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded of you. Then then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with Whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Interesting. The parable of the rich fool. What is this parable really about? And is the rich fool really the best title? What do you think this parable is really about? Anybody have a a thought or a comment so far? Anything that maybe you picked up? Maybe in the past or even now as we're reading through it? Covetousness. Covetousness. Okay. Anybody else? Any? Okay. Misplaced attention toward material things. Did I catch that? Okay. Anyone else? Hoarding. He was hoarding. Yeah, interesting. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Well, let's dig in a little more here. You see, when the rich man in Jesus' parable has this bumper crop, who does he talk to? Who does he talk to? Look at your, look at your Bibles there. Psyche. He's talking to his psyche, his inner being, his soul. He's talking to what's inside. Interesting. Interesting. He's talking to himself. He says, self. So he says to himself, self, what do you think? And then he has this like conversation with himself. A little bit of a problem there, right? So his first problem, um, and, and why is this so important? Well, again, I will remind you that in the Middle East, 
they would gather the family around if there was some kind of a bumper crop or something happened, and you would talk to the family, and you, and you, would, you would have this discussion about, what are we going to do with this? How should we proceed? How, how can we uh, make the best out of this amazing year that we've had, right? So does he talk to his family? No. What does he do? Okay, comment. Should be green. There we go. How he was taking more than he needed, I think, is the point of the story. Mm. Like, God promises us, promises us over and over in his word, like, I will supply all of your needs. And I think when we go beyond our, our needs, and God wants to give us what we want as well, but there's excess, and his excess, he was not surrendering to God. That's what I take from the story. Yeah, interesting. Good. I see a love it card. Your son's getting brownie points. <laughs> Any other comments? So yeah, it kind of goes along with hoarding, right up here. Uh, I think another point is like God is saying, or Jesus is saying like, it's okay to, it's not bad to be rich, but if you make it like, if you're it's like, I'm rich, and I think at the end it says, like, he who lays up his treasure for himself is not rich, but is not rich towards God. Mm. You know, it's like you can be rich and still, like, have a good relationship with God, but, like, who are you going to give your money to? You can't just keep it for yourself and make it your whole, like, I'm rich. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Other thoughts? So, number one, we see here he's having a conversation with himself the conversation he should be having with his family, so he's literally cut himself off from his family, all right? He's a man that's divided from his family. How many times does the man in this parable use the pronoun I? He's talking to himself. How many times does he use the pronoun? Do you see it there? I'll help you out. 11 times. 11 times he uses the word I in the parable. Traditionally, this would be an opportunity to gather the family to decide what to do with the abundance. He has a bumper crop and has more than he expected, but he doesn't even talk to the family. Or worse, he doesn't consult God about what to do. In fact, if you want to say, where's God in the story? Well, he comes to Jesus and says, tell them to give me my portion, right? The rich man's problem is not that he's selfish. What's the real problem? Yes, he is being selfish, but what is the real problem? Any thoughts? Okay, right here. He left God out of the calculations. Okay. He thus took God's glory to himself, and in doing so, he worshiped himself rather than God. He mm. became his own idol. Mm. So can I, can I use the word maybe uh, two words, self-sufficient? Became self-sufficient? Or there's another word that comes to mind, and that is that he has become satisfied. He has arrived. We finally got this crop. Now I can sit back and do nothing. He's become satisfied. He's arrived. He doesn't need anything or anyone. He's cut his family off. He's only consulting himself. And now he's saying, just give me my portion so I can go sit on my own private island and do nothing. Some of you are saying, man, that sounds really good. <laughs> well, you can see why he's wanting his portion so that he can go and enjoy his life. Does that remind you of Revelation? The church of Laodicea. What does it say? What is God's warning? Saying, look, you're saying to yourselves, I'm rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. You see, that's a big problem, isn't it? It's quite troubling. I no longer have to work. 
I can take a deep breath and do nothing. Sounds good. Sounds good, but that's not God's way, is it? You see, comfort is actually the biggest enemy of the church today. Did you know that? Comfort is the biggest enemy of the church. Some would say conflict, but I would disagree because conflict actually gives us the opportunity to sit down, to talk things out, to work things through, to say, oh, interesting, share your perspective, I'll share my perspective, and then at the end of the day, we can make a decision and move forward. But you see, when you've become satisfied or you've become uh, comfortable, growth stops happening, right? So conflict gives us the opportunity. But comfort says, leave me alone. I'm just going to hang out and coast in life. So Jesus, uh, who are you calling fool? Jesus calls the man a fool. So we still got to deal with that one because we all know. The kids know this, right? Are you supposed to call someone a fool? No, of course not. Of course not. The Bible says, don't say raka. Okay, but there's a different meaning here that Jesus is getting to when he calls the man a fool. Again, this is English, right? So we need to look back at the original language. We have a question over here. We'll come back to this. What do we do then with the passages such as in Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, which Mm. says, Uh, Be content. Let your conduct be without covetousness, which is what this guy had. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Be content with such things as you have. And then again, Paul said in 1 Timothy, now godliness with contentment Mm. is great gain. So... Yes, this yes. Idea, I understand where you're coming from on this yeah. idea. We can be so contented that we uh, ignore God. Okay, good. And I think these verses are pointing out the fact, yeah, we can be contented, and God wants us to be contented with our relationship with him, mm. that we can rely upon him, that he is faithful, he is trustworthy, and when he allows us and teaches us how to be godly, that godliness, which comes from him, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with contentment, the combination of those two, boy, that's what we should aim for. Wow, okay, good, good thoughts. In fact, we're getting to that in just a moment. Um, We're gonna look at two Greek words, and it's gonna help to answer just that question. So thank you for that question and comment. Um, So let's deal with this one first, though. Jesus says to him, you fool, right? So what did Jesus really say, and what did he mean by it? Okay, we're going to look at two different words. You see there, you have euphrino. Euphrino, which means what? Rejoice, be glad, to celebrate. Is there anything wrong with that? There's nothing inherently wrong with that. We want to rejoice. We want to celebrate. We want to kick back sometimes and drink our pog at the beach in our lounge chair, right? That's not sinful. That's not wrong. But is that what Jesus is saying to this man? No. No. He says, you fool. He says, aphron. The word used in the Greek, the root word is phron. And phron literally means diaphragmless diaphragmless so rather than just taking a breath of of air and letting it out he's saying you're completely missing it right so he's saying look so he's not saying you're you're a fool like raka you're good for nothing you're an idiot he's not saying that he's saying you're a fool, meaning you're incompetent. You're not really thinking this through. You are diaphragmless, okay? Basically, what he's getting to is he's saying, so he says aphron, okay? So diaphragm is fron. Aphron is diaphragmless, like you don't even have a diaphragm. So Jesus is warning us not to get to the point in our lives 
when, that when we receive the bumper crop, that we just use it however we want. But we don't help the people around us that need help. We don't use our bumper crop to be a blessing or to help others. He's giving us this warning. And so he calls this guy a satisfied, diaphragmless man. So now we have the new title. We can write now to Thompson Chain Reference. Tell them they need to change the title to what? Satisfied, diaphragmless man. What do you guys think? Should we take a vote? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. Of course, that's why, that's why we call it the rich fool. That's easier, right? <laughs> the rich fool. But when we dig deeper, we realize Jesus is saying something much bigger here. Much bigger. He's saying you become so self-satisfied. You just want to hoard these things for yourself. You don't want to talk to anyone else. You don't want to be held accountable. You're a fool. That's our English word for it. You're a fool. You don't want responsibility. And why is Jesus saying this to this man? We know that God knows everything. God knows that he will never reach a place of satisfaction. He thinks he will. If only I can get my portion, then I can sit back and relax for the rest of my life. Is that how it works, friends? Is that how it works? How about some of you that are retired? How'd that go for you? How many of you are busier now in retirement? <laughs> I see some hands going up. Yeah. So God knows that we will never get there. We'll never be fully satisfied. We'll always want more. And have you even noticed those that reach a higher position? Or they take on a new role of, of, of leadership and it's a heightened responsibility. Have you noticed how they start getting paranoid? They start thinking like you're friends with them just to get, you know, money or maybe their influence in something else. I see it a lot like in politics. Thankfully, that never happens in the church. But yeah, you start getting paranoid. You start thinking, you know, oh boy, maybe, maybe they don't really like me. Maybe they're just being nice because they know my position. They know that I can get them this or that thing. But God knows that we truly can't relax because we can't trust when we're self-focused, when it's all about us. So according to this kingdom tale today, what is it that God is warning you against? What is it that God is warning you against today? There's a story of a father and he comes to his son right before his birthday one year, and he says, you know, he's like, I want to get you something special for your birthday. I, I know you don't usually ask for what you want on your birthday, but I want to get you something special. You're going to turn 10. This is going to be a special day of celebration. What is it that you want? And the boy says, well, that depends. And the father says, well, what do you mean that depends? And he says, well, well, that depends because I, I either want a football or a soccer ball. If, if you think you're going to have time to play with me, I'd like a football because then we can throw the football in the backyard together. Well, but, but if not, maybe just a soccer ball, then I can play in, in the neighborhood with my friends. They like playing soccer. And so the dad says, okay, all right, uh, all right, cool. All right, conversation ends. A little while later, he goes back and recounts the story to his wife. And it wasn't then until he, it hit him. He realized that what the boy really wanted wasn't a ball at all. He wanted his father's time. He wanted his father's connection, his, his relationship. He wanted closeness with his father, not a ball. And so although it doesn't make sense maybe to their friends or people around or people that didn't know the story. Why on that day when the little boy opened a football that he and his father shared an embrace and tears because of the deeper meaning that was behind what that son wanted? What is it that God wants from us? What is it that he desires? He wants that whatever we have, 
that we're connected with him in such a way. He wants deeper connection, deeper relationship. Isn't that what God wants from us? Let's pray that he will continue to do that for us. Father God, we thank you so much for your wanting to have special time with us. Help us to want the same thing, to spend more time with you, to know more of you, and to know you. We ask that you will continue to guide us, and may your Holy Spirit provide what is needed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. We're going to sing our closing song right now. And please stand with us as we sing, The Lord Bless You and Keep You. May the Lord bless us and keep us until we meet again in his name. Amen.